I have with me today a really terrific guest. He is a retired Texas crime fighter. He did 25 years on the streets of Waco, Texas. And uh, and now in retirement, he is the star, and I mean the star, of an amazing podcast called Behind the Blue Curtain, where basically no topic is off limits. Stan Mason, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. So, Stan, uh, the first thing I got to ask you is, why did you become a cop? And uh, I grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and my mother was from Waco, Texas. In 1969, I went to Waco, Texas for a month to visit my mother's family, and I thought all I was going to see is horses and cowboys. Had a great time there. Uh, when we were at the bus station coming back, I was I saw two Waco cops, and they had the, the gun belt with the revolver and the bullets all the way around it. And I went up, they let me touch the bullets. They actually talked to me and spent time. And I told my mother I was gonna be a Waco police officer. I went back to Harrisburg and two years later, I had a very negative uh, run in with um, Harrisburg police, which basically somebody's purse got snatched and me and my friend were 12 years old coming from the mall and walking and we were a mile away, but we got picked up and. The lady said it's not them and they just put us out, never took us home, never. So I I had a big distaste for police for a while. When the Air Force, I was a law enforcement specialist in the Air Force for 11 years, uh, Desert Storm vet, got out, moved to Waco and became a Waco police officer. So Stan, when we look at what's happening now in the last, you know, almost year and a half of, of defund the police and the vilification of American law enforcement, you know, we've kind of stopped talking about community policing. You know, I ran a community policing unit for many years. You, you, you were, you know, you're kind of one of the godfathers of community policing. What do we need to do to get back to true community policing? You know, I, I think that uh, we live in a society today that's just a divisive society. We want to blame the officers for everything. We or the citizens for everything, and, and, and there's no middle ground. I think the first thing we have to educate the media, who is the biggest catalyst for the division that we have today, more than any single individual. I think that once we say, and they're going to hear this today, here to the media and to the public and to the officers who don't know, the definition of community policing is a partnership between citizens and the community between police officers and the community that provides for a shared here's the shared responsibility in solving community related issues and and once we get that basic understanding and i think we as police have done ourselves a disservice over the years unknowingly and, and we met well because we always went to problems and we said i'll take care of it and we tell 20 people that on calls that you go home and you can't take care of everything. But the next time you go there, they go, you told me you take care of it. So we've taken ownership of the problem away from the community. And then the community then falls into a state of perpetual professional victimhood. Instead of empowering them and not being, you know, afraid to look them in the face and go, I don't live here. You do. This is your problem. I am going to help you. I will not accept ownership of this. You will have responsibility. Yes, your hands are going to get dirty. Are you going to have to take some risk? Well, welcome to my world. You know, and, and I think that kind of frank conversation has to take place, which is what I did in some of the roughest neighborhoods in Waco. And, and it worked 100%. How do we get uh, young police officers, and again, and we talk about this a lot, you know, in, in the police academy, and, and rightfully so, you know, we've got to teach young people coming in um, that, you know, it's a dangerous job. You can get hurt, you can get shot, stabbed, run over, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, you know, so we, we have to instill a lot of mistrust in people and yet we're telling those young officers, um, but you've got to go into those neighborhoods and and uh, hug people and get involved in their problems. And this that. Where do you think the balance is for law enforcement? I, you know, I, I think the balance is we need to hire and recruit people based upon, to a degree, their life experience. 
Not saying that this person gets more points than this person, but I'm saying let's not kick out someone Well, they had a bankruptcy. Well, guess what? You know, I know in, in policing, bankruptcies are every day. Let's just tell that truth and get that out there. So I say, you know, Frederick Douglass said, without struggle, there can be no progress. Sometimes if you want to understand what's going on in a, in a particular demographic or a socioeconomic class, bring people in there who know that. And to chiefs, understand this, chiefs, you do not have solutions. You don't. A chief is a politician with a badge and a gun. That's, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that's the way it is in the hierarchy of policing. So your men and women who are out there on the street, your detectives who are putting in the work. You know, I, if I'm at a dead body, I smell that dead body. I don't read about it the next day in a report and make a decision. You know, give them the power, the power and the flexibility. From my experience, they gave me. I, that's all I did was community policing for five years till they got rid of the program. But I could go there, for instance, I transformed one neighborhood that was a extremely high. I was working shootings and murders like burglar motor vehicles in Waco, Texas. How did I change the neighborhood? Simply sat down, I got with Lowe's and Home Depot. And I went to every house on the block, including the drug house, and put a flyer up. Community uh, police meeting this day. People showed up. We held a class. This is how you grow a lawn. This is how you, you water a lawn. This is when you cut a lawn. We left that meeting after three hours. We went out in that one block area of my big geographic neighborhood. I had seven neighborhoods, so I had a quarter of the city. But And we actually plowed up everybody's yard and they helped. And everybody planted their grass seed together and everybody was put on a watering schedule and everybody cut their grass at the same time. So I'm cutting my grass now, you're cutting yours. We never spoke before, now we're talking. And then guess what happened in 45 days? That dirt that two generations is all you saw, you saw grass. Your place started to look like the place that you can't wait to hit the lottery and move to. The prostitutes left because they're not going to stand on a manicured lawn. The drug dealers left because they're not going to stand on a manicured lawn. So we addressed crime. And this is what I love about community policing. We impacted and addressed the nuisance crimes just working on quality of life that these people directly benefited from in, in, in their home value. So Stan, what you're describing is broken windows policing. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can you, because that has now, when we talk about broken windows policing, for example, you talk about that uh, in relationship to New York City. Now mm -hmm. we're told that broken windows policing, addressing those small nuisance crimes that, uh, you know, that bring a neighborhood down. Now we're mm -hmm. told that that's um, you know, it's either racist or it's inappropriate. Police mm -hmm. shouldn't get involved, one. And two, in a lot of areas, we don't have enough cops to do that anymore. Can mm -hmm. you talk about those two things? Sure. If, if we go straight to the core of it, and 25 years up, even when I went back to patrol, and I worked all of my 25 years on nights by choice. So I'm used to being out there where there are no resources. And this is what I found when we talk about the, the, the adversarial approach to the, what we call the broken windows theory, which is what I was trained under. People have to first understand that community policing is a, a concept that transcends the needs of the department or the city manager or the mayor, here comes the hard part, the special interest and people who want to gain financial gain. It deals with the individual, the neighborhood, and it is quality of life based for that area. So when you bring, when you come in and you institute community policing and you start teaching people to grow a lawn, you know, I did a deal where we had a neighborhood cleanup day. The city brought roll offs and they were shocked when I asked for them, but these people pay taxes. They deserve it. We trimmed the alleyways. The electric company came and trimmed all the power lines. Uh, we had drives to where the men came out. If there was an older lady, every, all your trash came out in the street. We put it in the big dumpsters. Anything metal that you had, you got a chance to take it down to the recycling place and guess what, you got paid. So these people, everything that they're doing, but you have to give them the reward. They're putting in the sweat equity to solve their problem. So it's not the city doing it. It's not to make the city or the police department or stand look good, it's their victory. But with that growth, you have to fight investors and real estate people who want to get this property at a cheap cost. Now the property value is going up. 
So the community policing in many municipalities, which is why it has not caught on in America, because in America, I believe, not certainly not the country, but a lot of institutions are afraid of empowered citizens who refuse to be victims, who are willing to tell their politician and or their preacher, you know, you're not getting it done. I don't need you. I've researched this on my own. I know we have eminent domain that's out there. We have gentrification, which is still alive and well and good by whatever means people want to put it. And it's not middle class people that are moving into these gentrified areas because nobody middle class has a $475,000 townhouse where six years ago there was a shanty on the river. But community policing empowers people. And, it, you, you know, I went to council meetings where the council people wanted to hear all problems from Stan, not the chief, not the specialist, and bring Officer Mason. Because the citizens believed I was a conduit. They could get roll offs or they can get this action from the city. We need sidewalks. We need, I had citizens complain. We don't have sidewalks. City needs to build sidewalks. You know what we did? We went out one Saturday morning with shovels and pickaxes and spades. And we dug up the sidewalk that you've had for 20 years that was buried under five inches of mud. And they said, oh, it is there. But the sad part was the city didn't even know there was one there. So you got to get your hands dirty. No, Sam, we, and you kind of alluded to this, and we talk about this a lot. There is a lot of um, weak police leadership in this country. And there's no other way to put it. There's a lot of great police leadership. But there is a lot of weak police leadership who, because like you said, you know, they're kind of more politicians than law enforcement personnel. And they're and a lot of them are just trying to keep their jobs. We see that. Um, what would you say to a, a police leader who wants to truly make a change, but really hasn't spent much time engaging their community or doesn't really know where to begin? You know, to them, I would say, I want you to go back and look at your budget and look at where you're spending money every year on programs that look good. It's great to say we have a drug task force, we have a gang task force, we have this task force. You got all these task forces, but you're not solving any task. So I would say community policing, number one, is very expensive, but policing, has, we have, and when I say it, I'm not talking about the men and women on the street. I'm talking about the leadership and the unions and the unions we've got to leave this mindset of government dependency most police departments are government grants for this government grants for that and these grants are supported by how many tickets you write and must write how many arrests you make and must make and so oftentimes you can be working one of these grant programs but you're struggling in i know this guy at mcdonald's can't afford this 350 dollar ticket but i gotta write it what do you do? And so that, that's a heck of a dilemma to put good men and women out there who, and when people say police don't care, that's garbage because you don't spend 40 hours a week and see the nightmares that we see. And we see horrors and, and you carry it home, you know, 20, 25 years. Imagine the worst movie you've ever seen and people come out, oh, I can't sleep. Live that movie at least once a week for 25 years with kids you knew. Go, go see the three-year-old that's been raped. It doesn't even, can't even form a sentence to tell you what happened. We live with these nightmares all the time. So I think that the media has gone overboard with vilifying and victimizing all police. But I think we have contributed to that narrative somewhat by saying it's a few bad apples. No, it's not. The bushel's rotten. Not the apple cart and not the orchard. But the bushel is, we're all very personal people. We work close. We know who's right and who's wrong. We know who's sleeping with who's right. We know all that dirt. Let's just be honest, we all know that. So let's clean up ourselves. Stan, and this is something that I wanna switch gears for a minute. This is something that we've talked about and that is a mm -hmm. huge issue in our profession and that is police officer mental health. We die at least twice as often uh, by mm -hmm. our own hand, as we do by felonious assaults, and 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 we can go beyond our own suicides and go to um, addiction and mm -hmm. uh, you know, like you said, you know, affairs and all kinds of um, emotionally dangerous stuff mm -hmm. for ourselves that ultimately affects 
our family, our friends, our community, and ultimately our agency, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. After, you know, I, I mean, when I, when I talk about the infidelity in policing, which is a, it's a big issue, but it, it's different with us because it's not sexually driven, I don't think. I think I, when I look at some of the, the women, I'm speaking for the men, that the men will choose to engage in an extramarital relationship with, this woman doesn't make any more money than their wife. She's probably not any more attractive. She's a stripper. But the one thing that stripper offers is that stripper understands what the officer sees. That person becomes an unofficial counselor, somebody who's not judging you, who when you say something, they see it. Or when even when they come up to you and you're doing a bar check or something, they go, you're doing okay. They don't mean it as just a basic greeting. They understand because when you walk what we call that thin blue line, you see both sides. You, you, you really, and you have to have a rapport with the bad people to be able, A, to rescue those who you can rescue and to recognize the immediate threats and put those people in jail where they need to be. And you can do that with grace to where the people you put in jail will respect you because they go, you know what? He put me in jail, but I watched this guy do this and do that. He or she is fair. So I think that for the infidelity, that part, I think that um, we, we put so much emphasis within the department on the hero status, that all these young officers want to be a hero. They, they, I'm bulletproof, I've got a vest, I've got all this tactical gear, I went out and spent $1,200 on a gun, I am, I am, I am. But this is a hardcore fact in many neighborhoods in America. While you may be tactfully sound, while we all practice, we want that muscle memory, we want our tactics. The only reason you went home because the people in that community let you go home. That's right. the realization of it. And you, you bring up such a great point that part of being a good investigator and every single patrol officer is an investigator, a big part of being that good investigator is your rapport with the mm -hmm. community. And that brings mm -hmm. us back to uh, individual community policing, and and you know, you and I both worked in this where uh, you know back in the in the nineties and stuff where mm -hmm. uh, community policing was a program, and mm -hmm. in reality, uh, you know, or a specialty unit or whatever. In reality, community policing is an individual police officer, isn't it? it exactly, it's a ministry. You know, Sir Robert Peel, the, the founding father of modern day policing. You know, in his in his nine tenets of policing, which I encourage all the listeners, please Google Sir Robert Peel and those nine tenets and really read them because, you know, he answers so many questions about what policing is or should be. And America did grasp some of the concept of it. And I think that we have forgotten that, which is the Ten Commandments of policing. You, you know, we Stan was never any better than anybody out there. I never downed the decisions they make, whether they were a drug dealer or whether they weren't. Because for the grace of God, there go I. Luckily, I had good mentors. And I grew up in an era where somebody could jerk me by my arm and get me back in line if I got out of line. Sadly, that's missing in today's society. But I think for a lot of officers, my biggest fear was that I retired and I would look in the mirror and you know, you're always going over your career, you're laying down at night. I don't ever want to have to deal with, I put somebody in jail because they made me mad. Or I wrote them a ticket because it was my job. I'll take the heat and say, you know, and this is just Stan. I, you know, no, I'm not writing this guy this $350 ticket. He smells like hamburgers, he's in a McDonald's uniform. He's got two kids at home. Where's the justice in that? Give me the write up. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Because now that kid has respect for me, which now has respect for the department. So we have to grow that seed. And to the community, stop being professional victims. You're, not, you're, you're oftentimes the victim of your own negligence, your own unwillingness to become involved. You know, if you want to be a renter your whole life, you'll never get owner's privileges. You have to stake a claim in your neighborhood and work with those who are willing to work with you for change for everybody. What would you say to a citizen watching this who is looking at their own community 
and saying, I, I want to do something and I want the police to get involved in it, you know, as far as community relations. What can one citizen in one small town in America do to bring this forth in their own community with the help of law enforcement? That question is profound on so many levels because my answer would be this simple to everybody watching this, ask yourself, do I know the name of the officer that works the beat in my neighborhood in the daytime? The one in the afternoon, the one at midnight, the other three that work when those three are off. Do I know the names of every one of those sergeants, that's six that work this area? Do I know the chief's name? Then ask yourself, does my department have a citizens on patrol program? Does my department have a citizens police academy? Does my department have a, a, a young person's police uh, camp? Do we have a power program? And you may say, I don't have the money to do all this, but it, you may not have it because nobody else in the city dared ask why not. Absolutely. Stan Mason, you never disappoint. Uh, <laughs> I want everyone to uh, know you, to uh, hear you speak. Where can people find you? Sure. Uh, Behind the Blue Curtain, which, by the way, when I started it, I was a working police officer. It was named by a homeless person in Waco. I had a competition on my Facebook to name the show, and it couldn't be the Stan Mason show. Uh, you can just Google Stan Mason, S-T-A-N-M-A-S-O-N. -S You'll see my website there. Everything I do, I pay for out of my retired salary. I don't have a GoFundMe. Stan, thanks so much for spending time with us today. And if you would Thank like you. more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Last year, law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain later.